and it turned out that God used that or something they said or then you can speak into their lives and you can believe things. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. It is so well with our souls, oh God, because of you. Oh God, it is well. Father, thank you, oh God. Thank you for your presence here, Lord God. Thank you that it is well and it will continue to be well, oh Lord God, until we see you face to face. Be with us now, Lord, as we open up your word. Father, speak to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we give the Lord one more praise offering? Amen. Amen. Everybody's staying in today. We want to hear what the Lord has to say, everybody. Uh, as I was praying, and I'm sure a lot of pastors all over the country and all over the world are trying to hear from the Lord to see uh, what he's saying during this time. There are so many times in the history of the world that uh, trouble comes and pestilences show up and... Uh, the people of God are known for standing out in such times. Somebody say amen. amen. Not because we're so all that, but because God is all that. Amen. amen. As you've probably noticed, uh, there's a lot of chaos going on in the world today. Uh, if you turn on the news or if you go on the internet to see the news, you will be bombarded with doom and gloom. The world it right now is collapsing on itself around fear, and fear is feeding on itself into more fear, and people have lost all of their peace, and I lost all of my bread. I went to get bread this morning, and the shelves were empty, <laughs> so no bread for us. But I, I want to look at, uh, just talk honest with you this afternoon and look at this current crisis in light of what Jesus said and what he says to us as his children. Whenever anything happens, good or bad, it's good to go back to what Jesus has said and what he is saying Amen. because it's a living word. Amen. And we can find everything that we need in the world. Jesus spoke a lot about uh, things that were coming. So I want to uh, just pull out some things from Scripture today so that we can uh, have the strength to take another step and live another day and be uh, the light in the world that God calls us to be. How many say amen? amen. First of all, uh, Jesus told us that trouble is, a, is to be expected. That's what he said. It, it's not a shocker to us, right? He said, trouble is to be expected. In John 16, 33, he said this, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. How many say amen? amen. Tribulation, let me give you the definition. It's grievous trouble, severe trial, or suffering. So, so when Jesus is telling you to take heart during a grievous trial or through suffering, what he's saying is to be encouraged. He's telling his people to be encouraged. He's telling us to have hope. He's telling us to be bold. He's telling us to be confident in the midst of it. He's telling us to not give up. He's telling us to be of good cheer, to have courage, to cheer up. It's something that we have to choose to do because Jesus told us to do it. Amen. Amen? Now, there are things that can cause us to lose heart that we have to be careful about. I'm just going to name three of them. Number one, this will cause you to lose heart, not running to God in the crisis. If you don't run to God in the crisis, you will soon lose heart. You know how fast that happens? Like that. If there's a crisis 
and you don't run to God with it, you will immediately lose heart. Just like Peter walking on the water, as soon as he turned his eye away from Jesus, he lost heart. And what happens when you lose heart? You sink. But Jesus said, take heart, not lose heart. He said, take heart. So we need to run to God with the crisis. Amen? Amen. Here's another thing that makes us lose heart. Looking at the crisis as bigger than God. Looking at the crisis as bigger than God. Listen, let me tell you something. There's nothing new under the sun. I was doing a little history check on things that have come down the pike in just this country. And it's pretty much chaotic, right? Uh, from the 1900s, early 1900s up to now, things have come and things have gone. Now, we take them seriously. We don't, we, we, we're not, uh, you know, saying uh, don't be wise in, in uh, like I was telling the men uh, at the men's Bible study yesterday. Let's be wise. Let's do our due diligence, right? Wash your hands for goodness sakes. Right? We can't use Purell. That's sold out. But let's not, let's not be afraid. Let's not be afraid, not the people of God. Why? Because this current crisis is not bigger than the God that we serve. Amen. Nothing is bigger than the God we serve. Nothing at all. Guess what? Things will come and things will go, but we serve the God of all creation. And he happens to love us. Amen. And we have now... Uh, we, we look to him. We're not alone in this world. Amen? So don't look at the crisis as bigger than God because it's not. The other thing that you can do to, to lose heart is to feed your fear. I'm telling you that if you look at the news all day and you feed on that and, uh, you know, and then after you've listened to it in your thought life, you start playing movies. You ever play movies in your mind? If you feel, feed your, or fill yourself or your mind and your thought with fear, guess what's going to come out? Fear. Why not? Okay, we know. Good. I got it. I got it. There's a pestilence. I got it. So I'm going to run to God, Right? I'm going to realize who he is and who I am in him. And then I'm going to run to the word of God and to the promises of God. Amen. And instead of feeding my fear, I'm going to feed my spirit the word, the manna of the word of God. Amen. And instead of becoming afraid, you become full of boldness and of courage. So... Trouble is to be expected. Here's another truth for us. Fear is overcome in the midst of trouble. You don't overcome fear when there's nothing going on. There's only one time to overcome fear, and that's when times are fearful or when you are faced with fear. If you're not faced with fear, you can't overcome it. So fear is an opportunity to overcome fear. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 5 and 6 and verse 8. The Israelites, brand new out of the promised land, uh, into the promised land, I should say, uh, they had to take land. They had to fight or face many fearful nations. It wasn't going to be a walk in the park, although it was going to be a walk in the park as long as God was going before them. But listen to what. God said to them, and the Lord will give them over to you, and you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or do not be 
dismayed. You know how many times in Scripture God reminds us not to be afraid, not to be dismayed, not to be full of fear. He reminds us constantly. Let me tell you some of the history of God delivering people from fear. The Lord delivered the Jewish people from the fear of the angel of death when he told them to put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of their door. And the angel of death passed over the people of God and they overcame the fear of the angel of death. Now that's a huge fear to overcome. By the way, we wear the blood of the lamb. We have the mark of the blood of the lamb on us. I hope you know that. The Lord delivered the Jewish people from the fear of Pharaoh's army as he consumed them with the water coming over them from the Red Sea. He delivered Jehoshaphat and the land of Judah from the fear of Ammon, Moab, and, and, and the people of Mount Seir when they came against the people of God. He delivered Gideon and the people from the fear of the Midianites. He delivered Peter from the fear of prison when he was shackled in the prison and from the Romans, the fear of the Jews and the fear of the Romans. He delivered Paul and Silas from the fear of the dungeon and of the Roman government. He delivered Jesus from the dread of the cross with all of its implications. You remember the Garden of Gethsemane, don't you? Where Jesus was agonizing. You know what he was doing? He was getting delivered from the dread of the cross. And when he got up from praying three times, if you got up from praying one time and you weren't delivered, take a lesson from our Lord. Go back and pray some more. And if you get up the second time and it's not quite gone, go back and pray some more. When Jesus got up from that position, he was ready to face the cross. And to lay down his life for the joy set before him. How many say amen? amen? So fear is overcome in the midst of trouble. There's something else for us to know today. To take heart. Jesus keeps you safe in the midst of your tribulations. I didn't hear one amen. amen. Not one. Let me give you another chance, okay, because God is the God of the second chance. I said that Jesus keeps you safe in the midst of your tribulations. Amen. Psalm 91, verses 1 to 4. Listen, as the Lord in my time of prayer highlighted these four verses, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. Can you declare that today? He is my God, and I trust him. In fact, let's say that together. He is my God, and I trust him. Say it again. He is my God, and I trust him. Give him praise right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then we continue in verse 3. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and your protection. We serve a God that takes care of things for his people. Amen. Let me tell you, you know, you've heard this story before, but I was thinking about it. God protects us. He just does. Either from it or through it. When my son Timmy, who's here, uh, when his appendix ruptured, it was misdiagnosed as food poisoning. And for five days, he lived with that poison in his body. 
he shouldn't have been alive more than one day. We didn't know till five days later when we rushed him to the hospital and they took an MRI. And when the doctor came out, it was so bad, he was shaking his head. He, he showed me, he, they took pictures of it. It was there so long that it had become gangrenous. It was all gangrene. He should not have been alive. But he said this. He shook his head. He goes, I don't know. But the body, his body built a wall around the infection. The reason he was alive because his body built a wall around the infection. I'm here to say that the Lord built a wall around the infection. God protects us. And then my wife, who was battling cancer at that time, and you know what happens when you're battling cancer. She was on chemotherapy, and chemotherapy destroys your immune system. You know that, right? It, it kills cancer cells, but it kills every other cell in its way. And it really devastates your immune system at a time when you need it the most. And guess what season it was when that happened to my son? It was flu season, and it was the height of the flu season, and there were signs in the hospital, beware, only be here if you need to be here. Doctors and nurses were getting sick, and they were short-staffed. So my wife with her, she had lost her hair, and with her little mask, she was not leaving Timmy's side. And they would tell her, you cannot be here. You cannot be here, but you know Tell that to a mother bear with her cubs. She would have had the doctor for lunch and we tried to get her out of there. Did you know that people around her got sick? But she was as healthy as all get out during that whole thing. That's the truth. At a time when she was at her lowest, God was at his best. Because Jesus keeps you safe in the midst of our tribulations. That's why David could say in Psalm 23, verse 4, even though, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Brothers and sisters in Christ, even though we walk right now through a dark valley. We will not fear any evil. We will not fear any evil. Because why? Because God is with us. Amen. Another thing I want to tell you as I was praying, Lord, what do you want us to hear? is this, God uses tribulations for your good. He certainly does. There's a lot of verses that we can go to. I, I, the Lord brought this one to my attention, James chapter 1, verse 12. Not the usual ones that you go to. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, let me tell you something here. The crown of life is not eternal life. You already have eternal life. The crown of life is something that you get. It's a blessing, something that you get in your soul, in your spirit. It's a reward for when you go through tribulation and you stand the test. How many here have been through a tribulation or a deep, deep trial, and you were better after than you were before the trial. Lift your hand and give glory to God. That's what I'm talking about. When you go through it and you stand the test, it's a test. You know, you know what a test is? Let me give you the definition of a test. The definition of a test is this, a test. What happens when you take a test? It shows where you are with whatever it is that you're being tested on. 
Where are we with our faith? Where are we? When a test comes, it shows us where we are. And he uses these things to show us where we are so that we can make necessary adjustments if we have to. Romans 8.28 says that he works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. James chapter uh, 1, verses 2 to 4 says, Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because the trial produces perseverance, and perseverance makes you mature so that you won't lack anything. So I want a crown of life through this one. How about you? Let me tell you what tribulations do. They will draw you closer to God. Anything, you know what I, I learned in my life? Anything that will draw me closer to God, I say this reverently, okay, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I thank God for it. If I have been distracted, if I wasn't paying enough attention, and something brought me back to my attention and my need for God, then to God be the glory. Because everything that I need is where God is. And if I have drifted away and he uses a, a test or a tribulation to get my attention back on God, then glory to God. That's for my good and for your good. How many say amen? It brings us closer to God. Don't you cry out louder? Don't you get more serious in your praying when a, when a problem shows up? Also, tribulations cause you to reevaluate your priorities. Not only us, but I was thinking about, you know, this world is an arrogant place. People are arrogant about God and about anything having to do with God. Most every day, except when something happens, People are going on like they have the world at their fingertips. You go to New York where the stock exchange is, boy, we're rewriting a high wave. Right, everybody's, and when you ride a high wave and you don't know God, you think you're a king. You think that you are, you know, every, you got this. You got this. And I was thinking about this. You know, all the world where, and all, one virus shut the world down. One virus. And all of a sudden, everything is shut down. Sports, everything, done. What happened? What? What's going on? Was there a nuclear explosion? One virus. The arrogance of this world is so easily snuffed. And I was thinking, boy, if this is the way we're going to react, what's going to happen in the end times? We better get ready, folks. This is a little test. It's a little test. Tribulations will test and grow your faith. They will test and grow your faith. Charles Spurgeon, famous preacher from the 19th century, he said this, Trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil and let us see what we're made of. Has your soil been dug up? Have you seen what's under there? I always tell my boys, if you pick up rocks near the soil, you're going to find worms. You know what? Our soil needs to get messed up a little bit and, and tilled up because stuff gets in there that shouldn't be. Amen? Amen? Tribulations also prove God's faithfulness. Tribulations prove God's faithfulness because when he keeps you through it or delivers you from it, it proves his faithfulness. Amen? Amen. And tribulations provide an opportunity, by the way, to share your faith and your peace with others. See, right now is such a crucial time for the church. Right now, you know, I remember when 911 happened, 9-11, I happened to be living in New York at that time. 
And I saw, as I was driving into, uh, I was on staff at a large church in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Tabernacle. And Brooklyn Tabernacle was right in downtown Brooklyn, about a mile from the Manhattan Bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge. And you could see uh, the Twin Towers as you were getting to the church. And as I was driving to the church from my home, I saw the, 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 the Twin Towers on fire. And when I got to the church, I went up to the roof of the church. All the staff was up there watching this unbelievable sight. And we saw one of them collapse. And let me tell you something. People were so open to hear about God then. In one of the most important cities in the world, where the arrogance is through the roof, where if you stand on a corner preaching about Jesus, nobody is going to pay attention. Nobody wants to take a track from you. Let me tell you, they were listening for a short window because people quit forget really quickly. You have a short window to tell people about the, the, the confidence that we have as children of God. You have an opportunity to tell people why you are confident and why you are not afraid. We take it seriously. Yes, this is not a joke. But we know who we are and we know who we serve and we know that we're okay as long as we stay looking to our God. That's the whole gospel, isn't it? Wouldn't it be a shame if we thought that God abandons us when he, we need him the most? So we have a window of opportunity. And the best way, I'm telling you, if somebody sees any peace on you right now, they're going to want to know why. Why are you so peaceful? Why don't you look worried? And you get a chance to tell them why. How many say amen? amen. Timmy, if you would come. God uses tribulations for our good. Here's another thing. Jesus wants to speak peace to you in the face of fear. You know what the title of this message is? I got it from God. All is well. All is well. You won't hear that on the news. But I'm here to declare to you, the children of God, all is well. Amen. The state of the union of the body of Christ is strong. John 14, 27, Jesus said this. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives, thank God. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. My peace, God is saying to you, the peace that I am, because God is our peace, my peace, the peace that I am, I am giving it to you. Would you receive it today? Would you receive the peace of God today? Would you believe God today? We have a, a, an opportunity to stand on the promises of God today. Would you believe that he's giving you his peace, not like the world gives it, as only he can give it. Only he can give you peace right in the midst of, of the trouble. Matthew eleven twenty eight and 29. Then Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary, and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, you should be at rest in your soul. And if you're not right now, it's okay. That's why God speaks to us, to remind us. You know, that's why... We read scripture and we reread re it and we read it again because God knows we're human and we forget and we do get afraid. But it's okay. All we have to do is remind ourselves 
of who we are and what Jesus has given us and what he died for. The last thing I want to tell you is this, is that it must be and it will be well for the children of God. It must be according to Scripture and it will be according to Scripture well for the children of God. You know, the coronavirus, there I said it, is named that way because corona is crown in Spanish. And if you look at it under a microscope, it has a crown. It has a crown-like figure. By the way, there was 18 other coronaviruses before this one. This one's 19. What we as the children of God have to do is not to crown the coronavirus as Lord, but to crown Jesus as Lord in our lives and not give in to fear. The coronavirus may look like a crown, but Jesus wears the crown of crowns, and he is Lord of all. Lord of all. Crown him king. The thing about this is, he is crowned king. But the question is personal. Have you crowned him king? Have you crowned him Lord in your life? Don't do what sometimes people do. When a crisis comes, take the crown off of Jesus and put it on the crisis. Oh, no, 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 no. Crown Jesus king. Crown him Lord of your life and remove the crown from anything else that's threatening you. You know, as I was praying, let me just tell you exactly how the Lord uh, ministered and how this message came about. I was praying and, and I was just going to just I had something to speak about today, which wasn't this. But as I was saying, God, you know, do you want me to, what do you want me to say? I, I believe in a rima word. You know what that is? It's God's word, but speaking right now. In other words, God takes his word, that's writ the written word, that stands for all time. And there's a word for right now using the same word, because this word is a living word. And so I want to know, God, what are you saying right now? And I got to tell you this because it floored me. As I was reading, I have a certain systematic way that I read the Word of God. So I, was, I had just read the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm usually in about three books at the same time, reading from different parts of Scripture. And so I had just finished Ecclesiastes. What's the next book after that? Song of Songs, right? And I was ready to launch into it, and I felt a check in my spirit. No, go to Isaiah. So I went to Isaiah. So now it's Thursday, and I'm up to Isaiah chapter 3. But before I read the word, I always pray. First of all, that's why I, I need to pray and prepare my heart and ask him for, uh, well, I have my time of prayer first before I read because I want the Lord to speak to me and give me illumination, and, and prayer helps me to get in the right uh, mindset to hear from God so that nothing will get by me. And so I'm up to, on that day, which I wouldn't have been up to had I followed my normal pattern of reading, the third chapter of Isaiah. And as I was praying, God, show me, what do I say? I read Isaiah chapter 3, verse 10. Tell the godly that all will be well for them. They will enjoy the rich reward they have earned. The message to you today that God put on my heart is tell the godly that all will be well for them. They will enjoy the rich reward they have earned. Oh, did I start praising the Lord. I mean, I should know that, right? 
think how patient God is. I should know that it will be well for the godly. But he takes time to tell me like he takes time to tell you when you read your own. You don't need me to tell you. God will tell you himself. But he did give me that to say to you. And then as I began to, okay, I, I have to realign what I was going to speak on. And the next day I got up and I began to pray some more. And then I read Isaiah chapter 4. <laughs> and this is not on the on the on the screen, but this is what it said. Then the Lord will provide shade for Mount Zion and all who assemble there. He will provide a canopy of cloud during the day and smoke and flaming fire at night, covering the glorious land. It will be a shelter from daytime heat and a hiding place from the storm's and the rain. God's word to you. He is a canopy over you to cover you and to protect you from every pestilence and every disease and anything else that this corruptible world comes up with. Amen. So I wanted to do this. First of all, I'm going to ask the worship team to come on back up. I would want the honor of praying for all of you. I would love for you to come up here. And we're going to pray that canopy over us. We're going to declare it. It's there, but we're going to declare it and agree with God today. And as we're singing it, we're going to sing a song of, uh, as we're here to receive it, we're going to sing a song of victory about who we are in Christ. Amen. Would you all begin to come? Come on up. I want to pray God's protection over every single one of us in Jesus' name.
ourselves. This is not about positive thinking, oh God. This is about your word, and it's about your promises, and it's about who you are, and it's about the power of who you are, and it's about the love that you have for your children, and it's about what you told us, oh God. And I pray, oh God, Lord, in obedience to what you said, oh God. Lord, I pray a canopy, oh God, over your people, oh Lord Jesus. God, that you would cover, God, each one of them, oh God, each home, oh God, represented, Lord God. Lord, folks at home, oh God, right now, that for whatever reason they, they had to watch from home, God, I pray a canopy over them in the name of Jesus, oh God. Cover us, oh Lord God, like you said and like you promised, oh God. Lord, you said it would be well, and it is well. We're here to declare that it's well, oh God. You are the cloud of covering over us. It's not a thing, it's you, it's your presence, oh God. And what can get through your presence, Lord Jesus? 
God, you stand in between us and the thing, oh God, that we're afraid of on our own. But God, we declare we are not afraid. We will not be timid. We will not accept a spirit of fear, oh God. But Lord, we will hear your word today, oh God. We are covered. We are covered. Hallelujah. We are covered with the canopy of your presence, oh God. We are covered. Say right now, I am covered. I am covered. I am covered in the name of Jesus. I am covered and clothed with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Oh, we give you glory, oh God. We give you glory, oh Lord Jesus. Oh God, use your people. Oh God, you're in this, Lord God, very evil season, oh Lord Jesus. Let our light shine right now, oh God. Right now, God, in these dark times, oh God. Let us be, Lord God, a herod to the world, oh God. Lord, to come under the shelter of your wing, oh God. It's for all who would come. It's for all who would come, oh God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord Jesus. Would you begin to praise him and thank him for his covering over you? Thank you. 